Um, our next speaker is Diana Chan. So she is um, Perak born, JB raised, and Melbourne based. And she is best known as the winner of MasterChef Australia in 2017. Um, after that, she swapped her previous life in finance um, to enter the FMB world and today runs a really successful multi million dollar dumplings business, which she is looking to expand into Asia. So without further ado, um, please help me welcome Diana on the stage. Thank you, Debbie. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we feeling? Good? <laughs> All right, so... Lisa. Okay. Um, good afternoon. So many of you may or may not know me, but um, yeah, I'm as... Debbie mentioned, I am a Malaysian born and bred. I've lived here for 18 years of my life, and then I've moved to Australia um, at the age of 19, and I've lived there ever since. Um, so today's topic, which I want to touch on, is basically about how we elevate Malaysian food to a global audience. And I can only speak for myself, being a, um, you know, me being uh, an expat living in, in Australia and I've lived there for so many years and how I try and bring that to a global audience. So most of you here I would imagine are Malaysians. So what do we think of when we think about Malaysian food? You know we think about like spicy flavors, fresh, bold, fried, steam, all these sort of flavors all these sort of methods of cooking that comes to mind. So we all know that Malaysian food, first and foremost, a, Malaysia is a multiracial, multicultural country um, with the three major races, Malays, Chinese and Indians. And then we also have a lot of subcultures underneath. And we as a nation, we really depend on food for living. Like everything revolves around food. Everything we talk about, um, our daily lives, it all revolves around the dinner table. And food is a culture, it has been embedded in us since we were kids. There's traditions and years and many, many generations of recipes that have been passed down through our families. So what are we doing as Malaysians to preserve these traditions? When we talk about Malaysian food, and the provenance of where it comes from. Do we really know where it comes from? Do you know, as Darren, I was talking to Darren earlier, do we know where our santan comes from? Not really. I mean, we buy it from the supermarket or we buy it from the shops and, you know, we use it. So what are we doing to actually get to know our food, get to know our culture? That's the most important question, I think. So what is the most popular dishes on earth when we talk about food? It's generally pizzas, burgers. Every country in this world will have a restaurant that serves one of these dishes. Yet, what is the biggest staple, largest staple on earth? Rice. Over half of the world's population depend on rice as a staple. You know, places like Asia, predominantly, Latin America, Africa, Rice has been cultivated in Asia for thousands and thousands of years. So, in fact, many of us will greet each other, and I think in, in Cantonese you, you say sek fan mo. Like, you always go, have you eaten rice? Have you, have you had your lunch? So, rice is so important, and, it's, and it, is such a, it is such a staple in so many people's lives. I want to talk about the most popular Asian cuisines. When we think about it, we don't often think on a global audience, I think. And I think we're also quite, um, we may be biased in Malaysia, but on a global, global scale, 
A lot of people that think about Asian cuisine will think about Chinese, Japanese, Thai. So how do we position ourselves and how do we make Malaysian cuisine popular to the global audience? Do we do, we do away with the stigma um, that Malaysian food is often deemed as street food? You think about what Malaysian food is, nasi lemak, cha kway teow, all these things, they are often deemed as street food. And do we veer towards the more restaurant quality and fine dining dishes? But how do we stay true to the flavors? How do we, you know, not overcomplicate things, but how do we elevate things and highlight the unique traits that we have in the Malaysian food? When you talk about Malaysian food to a lot of people, they're not unfamiliar. You think about the flavors of Malaysian food, it's about the fresh herbs, the spices. You know, we have so much of that in all our dishes. It's very aromatic. You know, a lot of our flavors come from naturally derived ingredients, pandan, ginger, galangal. And there's also like a really good level of spice used in most of the dishes. So we as a country, we're very blessed and to be so rich in heritage and culture. And we really need to do something to share our knowledge. And I often find that there is this sort of like hesitation. I find, and I find this also in my family. I'll give you a perfect example. When I try and get a recipe from my mother, she'll very happily give me the recipe, but she'll never share it with anyone else. And I'm sure many of you maybe would experience this. And I think if we don't realize that we need to document, we need to share these generational wealth and knowledge of these recipes and ingredients, we will not go anywhere. It's almost like a self-sabotage to not share this knowledge, hoping that no one will take the secret ingredient, that one ingredient that's so secret that will make the dish different. I think it really comes down to whether you want to grow and you want your, the younger generation to understand and build this culture. So how do we share our knowledge and preserve our dying culture without bastardizing the flavors? That is a question that I ask many of us. So my journey in food, I mean, my journey in food really started when I was a kid. I used to cook um, in the kitchen with my mom, I used to pre prepare ingredients. So really from the grassroots, grassroots level, I would go and shop with my dad at the market. Um, I would prepare ingredients from scratch. So even things like the nitty gritty things like plucking the tails of the tauge, of the bean sprouts, um, to like peeling one kilo bag of onions. You know, things like that, that really was where I started my love for food. And then when I moved to Australia at the um, age of 19, I actually started watching MasterChef first season, which was like 2009. And I watched this show and I used to think, oh my God, that's so cool. Maybe one day I could do it, but then I never really had the guts to do it because being an Asian, coming from a very typical Asian family, you had to study, um, you either had to be an accountant, doctor, a lawyer, right? Otherwise, what's the point? Um, so my journey really started from MasterChef in 2017, um, when I won the title of MasterChef Australia, season nine. A couple of years, a couple of years later, Asia Unplated was commissioned by SBS Food, and Asia Unplated was basically a show that I wanted to do. I've always wanted to, I always thought, do I need to open a restaurant in order to get my voice heard, in order to show people that I want to present Malaysian food? 
do I need to do that? Do I need to have a physical space where I'm actually cooking and serving? To a certain extent, yes, because you kind of want to establish yourself. In 20, just dating back one more year. So 2018, I had a pop-up restaurant called Chantine. And yes, I did, I served street food. Um, and I was there every single day for eight months, this pop-up was. But then I thought, there must be a better way. There must be a better way of doing this. There must be a better way of getting my voice heard, getting out there, showcasing people what, you know, Malaysian food or Southeast Asian food is about. And bear in mind, it's a wider sort of demographic. So I'm sort of preaching to the Australian audience. So it was not just Malaysian food. It was all about Southeast Asian cooking. So that's where Asia Unplated came through on SBS Food, and it is shown in Asia through Asia Food Network. So it highlights, you know, food from every continent, sorry, highlights food from the largest continent in the world, Asia. Um, you know, we, we go through different areas of Asia and we talk about the different foods. So there was a lot, there is a lot of variety in the show and that's pretty much what I wanted to show Australia. Um, so let's take a quick sizzle and then we can sort of wrap this up and we'll open up the floor for some Q&A. To me, there's nothing better than the sound of a sizzling wok. Fried rice, crispy noodles, spicy soups. Oh, the hook. Bit of a kick. This is what I was raised on but that's only scratching the surface. There is so much to explore when it comes to Asian cuisine. So I'm back in the kitchen for another whirlwind tour of the tastiest and most diverse continent on the planet. Oh my God, that is heaven. From the sweet, sour and salty flavors of Cambodia to the fragrant spices of Sri Lanka to my favorite Malaysian street food. Join me on Asia Unplated as we discover the secrets to some of our favorite Asian classics, as well as a delicious lineup of new and exciting recipes that are guaranteed to surprise. It's flavor central. Yum. Growing up in Malaysia, my love for the fresh, spicy, aromatic flavors of Southeast Asia began at a very early age. Mm. It really takes me back. But that's only one aspect of Asian cooking and there's so much more to explore. Oh. From India to Japan and everywhere in between, Asian cooking is diverse, but that doesn't mean it has to be complicated. It's just really simple Cantonese cooking at its best. We're doing away with the fancy stuff and showing how easy it is to create simple, exciting Asian recipes at home. Mm. Like street food at its best. Along the way, I'll give you the lowdown on buying Asian produce. That's like what I love. We get like betel leaves. Yes. I'll whip up some of the classics and bring in a few friends to show us how authentic Asian recipes really should be cooked. That's where all the real action is just there. This is definitely in my top 10 now. That's amazing. I'm going to be making this all the time. Just going to help myself to seconds right now. So that's pretty much um, a summary of the, the show that, um, that I've done with SBS, Asia Unplated, and I continue to do it. I continue to talk about my love and my passion for Malaysian fruit, not just through TV, but through socials and through events. Um, lastly, I'd just like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for your generous support over the last few years. Um, you know, it's been a real journey and I'm still discovering myself. I'm still learning every day. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers, Kita, for having me. Um, it's, been, it's been a really fantastic ride and Kanosh for having me out here as well, one of your sponsors. And I look forward to many more years to come and, you know, showcasing Malaysian food on an international level. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Diana, for a great presentation. May I invite you to um, have a seat and then maybe we can have a bit of a discussion. And the floor is open for Q&A. So, oh, wow, great. We have a lot of questions. I love it. Um, please fire over some more questions um, by scanning the QR code. 
Um, but perhaps I can start with some of my questions. Of course. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, um, so Diana, actually, which somebody addressed, and it's one of the top voted questions. So, um, you know, I, I've been very passionate about, and I speak a lot to, to female chefs um, yeah. and, and female entrepreneurs, um, and, and uh, we're trying to build a community around this. Um, but a lot of them, it, so it goes both ways, right? Sometimes female chefs, they really lean into the identity, and sometimes they're like, no, I felt no difference. I'm one of the boys. I can do everything just as well. So I wonder for you, um, have have you, how much of a factor have you found gender to be in, say, the, your career as well as in, you know, the success that you've had so far? Um, I guess for me, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky in a sense that, um, you know, I was, I was sort of given this sort of platform, so I kind of missed one step, um, a, a, a major jump. You know, I kind of like was given this platform to go, hey, you know, I'm here and I want to talk about food. In terms of gender, yes, I have experienced gender inequality in kitchen, 100%, and I'm very open to talk about it. But I think it's sort of, it's not so much the gender, I think it's a, the age gap as well. Um, I've, and most, most of those incidences that has happened in a kitchen would be with chefs that are far older than I am, predominantly male, um, because it is a male-dominated industry. And I think it's sort of like proving yourself. You gotta be out there and you gotta prove yourself, hey, you know what, I can actually do this job. And if once you prove yourself, then you know, there's 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 if they don't like it, then it's that then it's on them. So um, speaking from my experience, gender inequality does exist, yes. Um doesn't ha happen so often nowadays, I would say. Um, and I think it's it's about how you you know, you present yourself, it's, it's the confidence, I think do your research, be, be yeah, just, w women can only, w women can do everything that men can, honestly. I think we can, we can achieve everything. Um, you know, maybe there is the physical limit, limits to, to certain things that women can do, but apart from that, everything else, we can. Great. Do you find the, the gender difference, sorry, just to stay on this topic for a little bit more, do you find the gender difference more or less pronounced in the TV and media industry? Is it easier for women, of, of female sh cooks and chefs? Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a slight movement. I can only speak for myself um, a, a, as a well foreigner in, in another country in Australia. At the moment, in Australia, they're really recognising... Um, people from non-white backgrounds, so any and also females. So I think there's a big highlight and emphasis on celebrating female in any industry, as far as I can see. And in, through TV, um, I think it's not so much the gender thing; it's more the racial thing, mm. um, more so in, in in Australia. Here, it's it's slightly different, I guess. Mm. Yeah, it's really the, the era for D and I these yeah. days. <laughs> um, okay, great. And then maybe we can talk a bit more generally about Malaysian cuisine. I mean, you've been very successful, you know, putting the spotlight on Malaysia and Asian cuisine. Wh what do you think um, is driving, like what are people usually most interested about? And for people trying to elevate Malaysian cuisine, um, what aspects do you think they can emphasize a bit more wi without maybe losing that authenticity? I think, um, you know, I think there's this, this, there's a slight misconception in general that people often think, oh, you know, as I touched on before, Malaysian food is, you know, very street foody. It's not, it's not something that you can elevate, but I mean, you can elevate anything if you want it to, but it is true. You don't want to change the flavors, but I think it's also the audience that you, um, you can, I always think this, right? Like you can never please everyone. And if you can understand that and if you're happy with that and you can live with that, then I think you're, you're okay because not everyone is going to like your palate. Not everyone is going to... And that's okay. That's fine. Um, I think it's accepting that. I think it's also understanding and going from the grassroots level, like understanding the provenance of your food, understanding where uh, things come from. I always say this, like to create good food, you need to know your ingredients, 
if you have good produce, you're halfway there. You really don't have to do that much. Um, and it's and it's about respecting cultures and flavors. Mm. Okay, sounds good. Um, and so I so I was tasked by Darren to um, you know ask difficult questions and almost get into a fist fight. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask one on behalf of all the chefs. Um, so I interview a lot of chefs, right? And they always say, oh, all these young chefs who join my kitchen these days, they don't want to work hard. They you know they don't want to put in the years of um, experience and training because of reality TV shows, right? They want instant fame. They want to be head chef in like next year or next month. Mm. Um, so, you know, having found your success through MasterChef, um, what, what, what do you think about that? You know, what do you say when someone challenges you like that? Yeah. Um, look, my, my, my perception is quite different. Like I, I think there are, um, there are MasterChef contestants who um, who really push themselves and really know what they want? It's 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 a privilege to be on a show like that, um, but it's also it can be um, you know it can be frowned upon um, in the industry. Um, but I think you have to treat it with caution and respect. And for me, it's not about like I don't I'm not trying to prove to anyone that I'm better than them. It's about celebrating my passion. Um, it's about sharing my knowledge. And I may know more than some chefs because, and not from a technical skill level, but more from a like historical background. Like, you know, I, I know what I know and I would love to share and impart that knowledge. Um, in terms of, in terms of, you know, I think it, it, it really does come down to that, as I was talking about, sorry, earlier, about sharing that knowledge and being open. I think people are very scared and very insular in letting people in to knowing their food. And, and to me, it's all about a celebration. Let's, let's all share what we know so we can all be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, so this also links to one of the questions that uh, you know, the audience sent in. Um, so people say that TV, food TV is very theatrical and curated. Um, how do you convey flavors and you know, emotions um, accurately through TV, through this curated experience? Really, it's a lot of, like, you got to eat on telly, which is really not the best thing. Because um, <laughs> you, you're meant to look nice whilst you're eating. Um, so half the time, like, yeah, all that gets cut out anyway. Um, look, I think it comes down to, like, the individual, really, it, um, I mean, the recipes are there. Um, a lot of people will try them and they are tried and tested and, and, and you know, so far no negative feedback. Um, I, think, I think it's really hard to sort of, we, we, we don't just, you know, when we eat, we don't just eat with our taste, right? We eat with smells, it's all a multi-sensory experience we look at things as well. So I think when you look at something on telly, you actually want to eat it. And that's very normal because you don't just use one type of sensory experience to experience something. Mm. Yeah, I think it's part of the evolution of a chef where the food is not just about, uh, and that is the reality today. Yeah. It's really not about taste, but I mean, not just about taste, but it's also presentation. Visual, and yeah. and, and you need to have both sides, not. You know, it can't look good and not taste good. It can't yeah. just taste good and not look good. Yeah, that, that's what absolutely that's true. Yeah. I mean, certain foods are ugly, delicious, right? And they they don't need to look pretty. They just taste good. Um, but I guess it depends. Like if you're writing a magazine, if you're doing TV, you need the food to look good. Yes, one hundred percent. Okay. Um, do you feel you know staying on the topic of TV? Do you feel that TV has really brought Malaysian food to a wider audience, and how? I absolutely think um, TV, and not just TV, I think social media as well, uh, YouTube, one of the biggest, most watched forums in the world, um, has definitely elevated Malaysian food. And not just Malaysian food, any food, to be honest. Um, TV definitely plays a big part. It legitimizes, I think it legitimizes, if you can't, get to that wide of an audience. If you had a restaurant, it's impossible for everyone to try your food. But if you have you know, a good presence through social media, YouTube channels or telly, you can actually get a wider audience. 
So I do think that it is important and I do think that it does elevate Malaysian food. Do you have any, you know, with your experience uh, with TV, do you have any advice um, to maybe the younger chefs in the audience? Like, how do you get started? How do you wrap your head around that without feeling, I guess, like a sellout? Um, you know, there are chefs who just want to be creative and they want to, um, you know, stay behind the scenes and, and yeah. be really innovative. So how, how do you get out of that mindset where it's like, I need to do this, let me try and do this? What's the first step to do it? Absolutely. Um, through my experience, it is, it, it, TV is an industri- inter- interesting process. It is often very hard to get a show on air because of the production costs. Pre-production and post-production it does cost a lot. Um, and often that comes with the money that you get would be through sponsors. Any event, any, anything. You, you need sponsors, you need brands on board. And I think the hardest part that I found with Asia Unplayed It, because it was a non sponsored show was it was really a passion project for me um it wasn't about the money it was hey I want to do this and I want to do it properly I didn't care if I was doing recipes that were so simple that anyone could make yes they were achievable but they were still very authentic and very true um and I think that's you know it's often that fine line of finding how you're going to get those how are you going to get and achieve those flavors and, and also how are you going to get your audience without having that big money behind it, you know? Um, in terms of trying to get into it, I think start small. Um, start small, grow. Everything has to start small. Um, and then you, then you find your feet. I think it's, it can be daunting um, being in front of a camera, but it's just like with everything. The more you do it, the more comfortable you are. Yeah. How, how did you get um, over your stage fright initially? Um, still not over. <laughs> I actually hate the sound of my own voice um, every time I listen to myself talking, like now. Um, <laughs> um, I think. I think. Yeah. You know what? Nothing prepares you more than being on a show. For me, it was like Master Chef. Like day one, get in. Five cameras shoved in your face. Like you know, there's no. There's no. There's no personal space on, on, on a set like that. So I think it's just being, and it, with everything, it's like being, throwing yourself in the deep end and just going for it. Okay, awesome. Um, we have a very popular question with 15 votes, so I need to get to it. Um, you know, when, when you said you want to, when you said you are bringing Malaysian food and flavors around the globe, did you have to adjust the seasoning of the food according to the taste buds of the different audiences? Or do you remain, um, do you keep the original flavors to retain the identity of it? Absolutely not. I never discount flavors. I always, I'm so proud so proud of our culture. Um, I have never written a recipe where I've made, unless I had to with a brand, but in general, any, any of like my recipes or anything that I showcase, it is what I like according to my palate. And it might not be everyone um, everyone's taste, according to everyone's taste buds, not everyone's gonna like it, but that's fine. But I've always stayed true to yeah, my flavors and what I know, what I've grown up with and what I love. Um, yeah, I've never had to, I think it's about, and, I, and this is what I, I say, like it's without bastardizing the flavors. You know, how do we elevate, like Malaysian food, but not discounting on what it actually tastes like. You know, I, p- perfect example is like, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll cook at home and, and my boyfriend's like this typical white boy. Um, but not so white because he's very Asian <laughs> in his palate. And, you know, I'll cook belachan and he's like, mmm, the smell of belachan as he walks in and he loves it. And that's because I don't, yeah, I just don't discount the flavour. I just, I just do what I like, really. Do you feel that you'll alienate, uh, you know, some segments of the audience who maybe can't take the spice, can't take the, you know, the maybe, extreme yeah, flavours? Maybe, um, I, I would say... I would say where that comes in is when I do stuff for the masses. So like with the dumpling range that I have that I stock in the supermarkets in Australia, there is a certain level of, uh, there, there are a few different flavors, but a majority of them would be very low on the spice level scale because it is catering to the masses. Um, but in, in general, not really. No, I would just 
do it according to my taste. Yeah. So I read that you're, you know, you're going to bring the dumpling range to Asia. Uh, do you anticipate that you're going to have to, you know, um, design them, uh, produce them differently for the Asian audience because it's a homecoming to, you know, home ground? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm going to be quite creative with the flavors and I'm going to be using and, uh, and incorporating a lot of local ingredients um, because, because it, it is what the, it's what, you know, different region, different demographic. Um, and I think that's what people, I'll give people what they want. Um, and I'll also, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'll be very creative with the flavors. Definitely. I'll try and try and cater to the, definitely try and cater to the Asian market more so. Do you, how far along are you with uh, those plans um, and do you have any, you know, um, sneak previews of, you know, well, flavors you're working on? <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I've, it's it's very initial um, it's initial process at the moment, but yeah, I think we're we're hoping to to get it in um, yeah in the f first quarter next year, um, f but that's also pending. I'm trying try and get them in, um, but yeah, maybe start small and then grow big as well. All right, sounds very sensible. Um, we have another very popular question, which is, should Asian cuisine need elevating in order to be valued, and what do you think constitutes elevation? I think this question really depends on the audience that you're um, presenting to. Um, I, I w my personal view is no. Um, I don't think we need to, I don't think we need to, I think we need to elevate it in terms of sharing the knowledge, but I don't think we need to elevate it just to cater to uh, different taste buds. I think it really depends on the audience you're talking to. Um, if the audience is familiar with Malaysian food, then I think you can be quite honest. I, to me, there's nothing better than simple food done well. S point blank, like, just do the basics well, and then you can sort of work your way up. Mm. I find the challenge with elevating, you know, lo um, local or Asian food is that there's always a price point comparison, right? Which is the oh, it costs like two dollars. Yeah, yeah. Do you do you find that challenge um, in yeah. you know among the diaspora say, yeah. in Australia as well? And how do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, I actually find it. Um, I actually find it very apparent in say somewhere like Australia, right? You go out to a restaurant, and uh, most of my friends that I hang out with would be either pe people in the food industry, not just chefs, but like you know food journals or whatever, people in the industry and people who just generally love food, like foodies. And so we understand the cost. When you're running a restaurant, it's not just, it's not just the food cost, it's the fit out, it's the, the wages that you have to pay, it's the everything, the, the, you know, everything in the restaurant costs money. So yes, there is a price tag to pay if you want food to look a certain way, if you want food to be presented a certain way. Um, if you want certain ingredients, yeah. But I think if it is, if it's if it's warranted, if the food is good, then I'm sure people are prepared to pay. I, yeah, I think we definitely saw that um, over COVID um, when you know. Um, just to digress a bit. So I, I lived in Hong Kong and when people couldn't travel back to where they came from, then they were definitely willing to pay for the original authentic taste. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I think there's one more question. So exploring, um, so so you travel around a lot um, and uh, I, just now you mentioned that you're going to India after yeah. this. So um, when you travel around Asia, you, might, you, you must have come across Indian food. What are your views about Indian cuisine and... <laughs> Um, yeah, tell us about your upcoming trip to India as well. Yeah. Um, I, I look, I love Indian food. Um, I always joke about this. Uh, there was a question and in interview, because I'm heading to India straight after this uh, tomorrow with Kanosh. And there was an interview question about <laughs> what was your earliest memory or experience with Indian food? And I think at the age of two, um, I think it was two, but I can't remember this. I was actually looked after by an old Indian lady and she used to feed me curries as a two-year-old kid. So I think it's embedded in me that I actually like really spicy food. Um, my, like, my experience of Indian food in Asia has been great so far. I think we get generally pretty good Indian food. Um, I'm really excited to head to India. Um, 
with Kanosh for a series of dinners and masterclasses. I will be showcasing a lot of Malaysian food when I'm there. Um, I think the, I India is a, a, a market that um, I think they're very open to the, the flavors of Malaysia. Um, there's lots of similarities, yet, yet lots of differences. Um, so it'd be really interesting to, um, yeah, to bring, bring our food there and um, showcase it to the local audience. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much um, for you know, squeezing Kita in on your very busy schedule and uh, really enjoyed this chat with you and I hope the audience did as well. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie.